It's time to take a new approach to finding true fulfillment in your career, health, and state of mind through insightful conversations with those who have found their professional and personal passions while achieving balance. Whether it's entrepreneurs, athletes, or healthcare professionals, we bring you real people, real growth, right here on the Boost Podcast. Now, here's your host, Elena Lipson. Hey, Boost Squad, and welcome to episode 26. Elena Lipson here, and I am pumped to introduce today's featured guest, Ben Foster. Ben, are you ready to join the Boost Squad? Absolutely. Thanks. So before we dive into today's episode, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Mosaic Growth Partners. Mosaic Growth Partners provides growth strategy consulting to entrepreneurs and organizations in the healthcare and older adult baby boomer market. They can help you bring a new product or service to market, identify and engage new customers and partners, or grow your market share. They also provide coaching and training. For more information, go to mosaicgrowth.com. That's M-O-S-A-I-C-G-R-O-W-T-H dot com. Now back to today's featured guest. So Ben is a full-time product advisor who's currently working with over a dozen startups up and down the East Coast through his firm, Foster Innovation. He has a top-notch reputation among entrepreneurs and venture capitalists who are eager to get his guidance as they scale their companies. Previously, he was the VP of Product Management and User Experience at Opower, a company he helped lead to a $1 billion IPO and was later bought by Oracle. Ben started his career in the first big internet boom and rose to the ranks at eBay in the early 2000s, and he hasn't looked back since. Ben, we are so happy to have you here with us today. So much great content to get into, so let's just dive right in. The first question I have for you are what are the three things that we should know about working as an advisor to startups? Yeah, good question. You know, to me, the, you know, the, the three things that I sort of think of would be, one is it's important to recognize the complexity and the challenge that a lot of entrepreneurs face when they're trying to start their own company. There's this thing that a lot of companies refer to, which is called product market fit. And what they're looking for is ways of, identifying what the problems are that they're trying to solve for their customers, who their customers are in the first place, and how they can solve those and do so in a profitable way. So the first thing to be aware of is that I try to help companies with identifying what it would require to get to product market fit. And then secondly, after that is after they've identified what it would take to make that happen, is they want to be a product driven company. And if you separate companies between those services driven companies and those product driven companies, If you look at just about every company that's had a billion dollar IPO, really it's those product driven companies that make that happen. And what differentiates these two different kinds of companies is that product driven companies create one single solution that's going to work for several different kinds of customers, whether that's business customers or consumers. And so what they're looking for is the right one solution that's going to sort of fit everybody at the same time, or at least be close enough to fitting everybody's needs. You can imagine, for example, that Facebook probably has several different kinds of you know, customers that are out there. And maybe one customer wants something that's slightly different from the product. Maybe some other customer wants an additional feature. But they try to create one single product that works for everybody. And they've done a remarkably good job of doing so. So in my business, what I try to help do is coach clients on how to generate that one single solution that's going to work for their entire customer base and really try to help them be a product-driven company rather than a services-driven company where they're kind of meeting the custom demands of every individual client that they're trying to do business with. So those are sort of like the first two things. And then the third thing for me is that as a consultant, your reputation is something that you can never sacrifice. You know, you've got to make sure that you do a great job with every company that you work with. You've got to make sure that, you know, people can continue to come to you, you know, with questions and that you can continue to provide recommendations for them. And that's got to be based on real world experiences, not just pontification about, you know, what might be a good idea or what might not be a good idea, but be able to kind of relate to them real honest stories about what kinds of experiences you've had from other companies that you've worked with, because the best way to fail fast, the best way to learn before making too many mistakes is in many ways to learn from what your other companies have done before. Yep. Those are great tips. I want to press you a little bit more about this idea 
of a product driven solution. So I understand the difference between, you know, products and services. And you talked a little bit about how with services, you end up providing kind of customized solutions, but are there ever things where you would consider a product, like, let's say a coaching program that doesn't end up being customized for the group? Does that ever fall into like a product because it's not customized or do you still consider that a service-based business? Yeah, you know, I, I would consider that a product-based business. It may be the case that you, in order to deliver that, you have to provide some sort of, you know, time of your own. But you know, effectively, what you've taken is a service which is trying to consult and help with solving particular kinds of problems for individual customers, and you've productized that mm -hmm. by coming up with what is the right single solution that's going to make sense for any given customer. And in effect, the differentiation to me is when you think about a product-oriented company versus a services-oriented company, in a product-oriented company, what you're trying to think of is, what are the requirements that the next customer that I haven't yet met, what is the requirement set that they're going to have for me? And how can I define what my solution is going to be for them up front before I even meet them? Versus I've got to talk to every individual one to try to understand what it is that they're trying to solve specifically, and then customize my particular solution to what their needs are. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Another question I have is, so I know I personally love working with startups. They love to see results. They work really hard. There's a lot of passion and you can get things done oftentimes more quickly than you can in more established, bigger organizations. But one of the challenges I think that a lot of advisors and people working with startups have is how do you get them to pay you? So especially if they aren't even in market and don't have their product launch, what's a good business model for someone who's looking to work with these companies? <laughs> It's funny that you bring that up because it's definitely a struggle for me, I think, from time to time. The thing that I have looked to with startups is, is I'm just like with employees, it's the same thing, kind of thing is true, which is, look, if a company is extremely well-funded and they've got $40 million sitting in the bank, then obviously you can demand a reasonable kind of salary. It should be according to market. I think that when you're working with a very early stage company, like you know four people sitting in a garage, it's a different beast. And the same way that employees have to take often a pay cut, but the way they take is a much larger portion of equity. The same thing is basically true for me, which is I have to be flexible in working with companies about whether I'm taking somewhere on the spectrum between all cash and all equity. And usually it's somewhere in between that ends up being best, both for myself and for the company. And I can give you reasons for why that's the case. But I think that the most important part is being flexible on how compensation is, is structured such that you have aligned incentives to want to succeed along with the company, but you also don't want to be completely dependent solely on equity because the reality is I can't pay a mortgage based on stock options. No, you can't. <laughs> so without putting you on this spot too much then, so it sounds like you're taking equity in a lot of the startups that you work with. Does that mean that you will only really work with companies that you really believe have viable products and solutions? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, like you said, we have to pay the mortgage. So sometimes that involves working with clients that maybe, you know, aren't going to really listen to your advice. They might go down the wrong path. But if you're getting paid in equity, you wouldn't want to work with people like that. So do you kind of have that as a rule that you really only work with people and companies that you truly believe in? Yeah, Elena, you're, you're touching on a lot of really interesting points on this. I, I would say that the first thing for me is when I think about compensation for the work that I do is I have to be willing to accept the risk that's associated with the startup being successful. It, very much the same way that a VC would. You know, VCs are going to decide to put money in a company or not based on whether they believe in the principles of the company and they believe in the founders, et cetera. The same kind of thing is true for me, which is instead of having a finite resource that I can put into the company, which in their case is capital, for me, it's just hours of my own time. And I have to be very careful with where I decide to spend that time because there's an opportunity cost of doing so. So I ask the same kinds of questions that a VC would ask about companies, which is, I want to go through their financials. I want to understand what their vision looks like for the future, et cetera, as I'm evaluating the equity that they're willing to pay. Now, one thing that you had noted is that, you know, if I don't necessarily believe in the founders, or I don't necessarily believe that the company is going to be successful, you know, that still may work in an all cash situation. I think that that's true that in the short term that can work, but I still try to be very selective with the companies that I work with because half of the benefit for me that I've realized is not just the direct benefit in terms of compensation that I'm getting with working with an individual company, but the other benefit is the marketing value that is derived from that as well, whether that's direct through the referrals that they make or whether that's the case of you know just, just having the brand name on my background 
and somebody saying, hey, wow, you worked with this company, I'd be really be interested in working with you as well, because I really feel strongly that those are some really smart people. And the fact that you're working with them means something about what you're capable of doing as well. You know, half my business comes through referrals and people recognizing the set of companies that I'm working with and the set of companies that are on my roster. So when I am aware of that, that means that I don't want to waste my time working with companies that don't have an opportunity to succeed based on the advice that I'm going to provide. And that could happen, you know, for two different reasons, either because they're doomed to fail for some other reason that's outside of the scope of the kind of work that I'm going to do with them. Or the other reason that that could happen is because, like you said, they're not simply just taking the advice that I'm providing. And if at the end of the day, they're not going to take the advice that I'm providing, then it means that I don't really have the, the level of influence that I'm looking to have within the organization. And if I can't have the influence, then to me, that's not really a fit in either direction. And that's something that I would opt to not work with those companies because I don't want to put myself in a situation where I, at the end, don't feel like they would say, wow, that Ben guy has been really effective, really helpful working with me. If I don't think that that's going to be their conclusion at the end, then I usually prefer to cut ties early on. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. You also just mentioned that about half of your business comes from referrals. So could you talk a little bit about where the other half come from if you're out like scouting companies that you want to work with or how do you find those other clients? Yeah, you know, it comes almost all from referrals at this point. The difference is half of them come from referrals that are directly from the companies that I'm working with. And the other half are coming from venture capitalists, from board members, et cetera, that are more peripherally related to the companies that I'm working with, but they have a vast portfolio of other companies that they work with as well. And so word might get back to them to say, you know, we've really had a lot of success working with Ben to help us with our product strategy or with our product organization or to help us to become a product driven company the way we always imagined that we would be. And when that word goes back to the VC firm, they say, hey, this is really helpful for this one company that we have in our portfolio. But what about the other companies that we have in our portfolio as well? And so what I've found myself doing is ping ponging a bit between working with a company and then meeting all the board members of that company, realizing that they have many different companies that they work with, working with that next company, and then continuing to follow that pattern of then meeting their board members and subsequently being introduced to the companies that they have in their portfolio. So referrals is pretty much 100% of my business at this stage. I'm not spending any time at all doing outbound direct marketing of the services that I provide. It's really coming exclusively through that. And it's actually turned out to be much better than when I had taken some time in my prior years doing this of trying to directly reach out and say, you know, here's a pinpointed company that I'd really like to be able to work with. Let me go try to reach out to the CEO. I was always just sort of met with a cold shoulder to some extent. And when the referral is coming through somebody who's a board member or has some sort of a pre-existing relationship with the company where they can trust what that person has to say, that kind of referral has just been that much more effective for me. So some of them are coming directly through the entrepreneurs that I'm working with, and some of them are coming more indirectly through the investors in those companies. Great. Well, that's an excellent position to be in. And a little bit later in the show, I want to ask you kind of how you've gotten to that point. But before I do that, I want to hear from you a little bit more. You're doing all this work with startups, and I want to hear about what are some of the do's and don'ts that you see with startups right now and where you think that's headed in the future. Hmm. When it comes to do's and don'ts for startups, I think <laughs> the reality is there's probably about 100 don'ts, and I could spend the next couple hours rattling a lot of those things off. I think that you know if you aim to be a product-driven company, there's a lot of things that are implied in that about what it takes to be one. I think that there's a lot of continuous focus on the customer that ends up being really important. And anytime that a company deviates from those things, I sort of think of that as being the don't space. Within the do's, what I've found is there's a few different a few different patterns, I think, that are consistent from successful startups. One of them, I would say, is that many successful startups end up having a couple different founders. And there's a really interesting yin and yang effect that can happen with two co-founders that I've seen time and time again. I think this happened when I was working at Opower, where I was the VP of product and user experience there where the founders of the company, Dan Yates and Alex Lasky, had this phenomenal relationship between one another, not because they agreed on everything, but because they disagreed in the right places and they called each other out in the right places. So Alex Lasky was the president of the company, Dan Yates is the CEO, and Alex's perspective was always, well, why can't we do that? Why can't we just hire contractors to get this thing done? You know, Let's just push the envelope as to what's possible. 
And I think Dan was much more the pragmatist and he could look at it and say, this is what's actually feasible. This is what's not. Here's how we'd have to operate it, et cetera. And that combination between those two people and, and the interplay between those kinds of conversations made sure that both at the same time, we weren't subjecting ourselves to group think, thinking that something might be possible when in fact it wasn't, but we were never holding ourselves back because we weren't exploring the future potential that the company had. And it's not to say that either one didn't you know, push the other one in the opposite direction as well, but I think that the level of quality of the conversation that we had and that the rest of the executive team was exposed to was really powerful. I see the same kind of thing with many of the companies that I consult with. One of them would be Contactually, who's based here in DC, where they've got two co-founders and they have a, a fantastic rapport that very much reminds me of that same kind of yin and yang relationship. So I think that in terms of dues, one thing is that it's perfectly fine to have frequent disagreements within the company, to have various people who are part of the founding or executive team who are challenging one another and putting pressure on them to defend some of the decisions that they're trying to make and to really have good sort of like discourse and good dialogue. That's a sign to me of a healthy company. I think the second one is that it's really important that a company understands very, very deeply the recipe for their own success. Now, some companies have more success and some companies have less. But at the end of the day, what makes you successful as a company at any stage is understanding what makes your product tick for their customers. And I'll relay another example from my operational experience, which is at eBay. And this is a little bit more of a counter example of how it didn't work which is when we were at eBay, there were dozens of product managers who were working at the same time to try to make the overall eBay experience a better one. And at the end of the day, what we were trying to do was each of us as product managers had different areas of ownership where we were trying to make our particular area of the product a little bit better. And so we would provide these recommendations to the executive team about what our ideas were for you know, the, the way that the product could best be improved. And we would do these ROI analyses and NPV analyses to try to, you know, provide some numbers behind the scenes as to why our idea was better than some of the other ideas that were out there. But the problem was many of the ideas were pushing the envelope a little bit too far. They were changing the way in which business was typically conducted on eBay. And there was a general reluctance from the executive team at eBay to adopt many of those features, even though they would have been great ideas because they said, well, there's a secret sauce to eBay's success. You know, we don't really know exactly why people continue to bid so much on these items. And we don't really know, you know, exactly why sellers continue to list on our platform versus on Amazon's, et cetera. And when you don't understand your own recipe for success, then it leads you to make more conservative decisions, which I think in the startup world is sort of like long-term a doom to failure. And as a result, there were plenty of really good ideas that we had that never really saw the light of day. And in the same time, you have Jeff Bezos and Amazon making extreme strides towards making a much better overall consumer experience on their end. And while we were stuck trying to make better experiences for sellers to try to list more items, all the buyers of those items were being stripped away from eBay by Amazon, who was making a much more compelling buyer experience. And the lessons that I learned from that were several fold, but I think one of the ones that's applicable here is you have to understand what makes your own company successful. And eBay's mistake on that was to say, there's a secret sauce. And that's fine when it comes to, you know, you don't tell your customers what your secret sauce recipe is. But if you don't know in the kitchen what your own secret sauce recipe is, then it's going to be really hard to replicate that. And it's really hard to improve that over time. And I think that that's something that Amazon really understood. And it's something that eBay really didn't understand. And the second thing is you have to understand how your business actually runs. And had we recognized, I think at the time, that eBay was actually being run not as a business, but was eBay was effectively an economy. The way you grow an economy is very different than the way that you grow a business. And if you realize you know, how you put money into the economy and how you drive demand by doing that, there would have been a recognition that we really should have focused on the buyer's problems rather than the seller's problems. And that sellers would have found a way to meet that demand because the money was there to be made. One of the big lessons that I learned from that was that supply follows demand, not the other way around. And that was something that we as a business at the time didn't really understand. Had we understood that, I think eBay could have actually dominated and won much of the market share that Amazon ended up stripping away at that time. So really interesting kind of like lessons learned. But to me, that the same kind of lesson applies back to the startup world, which is 
understand at least how your business really functions and don't have this sense of, hey, there's a secret sauce here, but we don't know what it is. And therefore, we're uncomfortable making the bold decisions that we need to to continue to innovate and make sure that we don't get leapfrogged by our competition. Yeah, those are really great examples. And both of them kind of make me think, you know, thinking about when you need to understand the recipe for your own success and how your business runs. Those seem so obvious. And a lot of times I work with clients who have these issues. Maybe they don't know who their customer is and what their problems are, yet they've gone and built a whole solution already. And to me, it seems so obvious. Well, why didn't you go figure out who your customer was first and figure out your problems and and the problems that you're solving for them? But a lot of times companies, even when they've grown to be market leaders, sometimes skip over these obvious steps and it really kind of can shake the whole foundation of their business model. I always find it interesting that when you look from the outside in, it sometimes these things are so obvious, but when you're like in the middle of it, these very obvious foundational things can often be overlooked. I think that's true. And I think it's a function of being blinded by your own success. In eBay's case, what was happening is this was during the era, this is from, I was working there from 01 to 05, and there was just such an enormous growth of customers coming on to eBay. And that was just because there were so many more people coming online back at that time. And there were people who literally didn't have any form of an online account back then, which is crazy to think of that now, (laughs) you know, these days. But, you know, as people were creating a digital profile for themselves and starting to interact and transact and things like that online, eBay was continuing to grow despite the fact that they were losing market share as a percentage. And so when you look at the numbers, you sort of say, well, everything's going really well. So we don't need to understand those things. You know, the, the, the real big issue here would be if we made a great mistake and we, you know, lost a ton of market share, the reality is you actually already are, you just don't know it yet. Right. And your own success can sometimes be a veil for the underlying problems that are underneath. And I've seen the same kind of pattern happen time and time with startups. Yeah. So one of the things that I can provide as an outside consultant is, that third party outside view that helps to kind of compare that one company, which they don't really see in the same light compared to other companies that are out there and saying, Hey, wait, you guys are missing the big picture here. Here's something that you guys can really make some good strides on. Yep, absolutely. So let's shift gears a little bit. You mentioned before that almost all of your business comes from referrals right now, which is a great position to be in. So obviously you did a lot of things right to get to the point that you're at now. So can you share some of the tactics for how you've grown your business to this point? Sure. Happy to. I think that one of the things that that I found was the case was that early on, I experimented a little bit. I experimented with how much focus did I need to put on each of the clients that I work with? How much should I be thinking, for example, proactively about what their opportunities are to make them a better company? And to what extent should I be merely there as a sounding board in case they come to me with questions? And I think within the advisory space, many advisors go into the second camp of saying, well, I'm here, I'm on retainer, I'm available if you have any questions. But the problem with that is that companies often don't know what they don't know. You know, they may think that they understand, for example, their customer or their business as well as you think that they should understand it. And so they don't come to you with those kinds of questions, asking what they can be doing to better understand those dynamics. And if you're proactive as an advisor, then you can encourage them to think about things in a new light and in a new way and go through different kinds of processes and practices and exercises with them to help them better, you know, understand themselves and better you know, succeed as in meeting their their own goals that they set for themselves. What I had experimented with early was, you know, maybe I should sit on the sidelines and, and be more sounding board to them so that I'm not interfering with their business. And what I found is that that absolutely isn't the right place to, to go, that the right kind of process that I should have when working with companies is to be thinking about them on a weekly basis. So tactically speaking, what I do is every single Monday morning, I wake up and the very first thing that I do is I go through my spreadsheet of my different clients. I look through all the notes that I have of what's the current goings on there. I look at the articles that I've recently read over the course of the last week and say, do any of these articles apply to the companies that I'm working with? Are there exercises that are embedded in those that I think would be pertinent to some of these companies? And then I try to push the companies along to try to adopt some of those practices. And I, you know, maybe what I'll do is I'll learn from one of the companies that I'm working with that they're solving a completely different problem because they're in a probably, you know, a completely different space. But the solution that they put in place is something that would be applicable more broadly to other kinds of companies in completely different domains. And so I might, you know, look back at what I did over the last week and say, what can I do to help proactively drive what my next set of clients 
you know, could benefit from based on the, on the interactions that I have with other customers that I'm working with. And in having that more proactive approach, I think that I've been able to separate myself from many of the other advisors that people work with, whether it's sort of more of a celebrity advisor or maybe they're, you know, just there so that they can have a face on a, on a web page somewhere or on an investor deck and really try to like drive results for them and point them towards issues that they themselves don't see and then try to work proactively to address those with them as well. And that's been a very fruitful exercise for me. One of the companies that I'm working with is called Whoop, and they make an, a wearable device, which just recently was announced to have a, a great deal with the NFL Players Association to get this device worn by all the NFL players where they can sort of expose their data selectively to their teams and to some of their fans. In that case, there was a recognition that I had that they hadn't crafted yet their design principles. And so in many ways, the design of the product was kind of going in one direction, and then it was sort of tangentially going in a different direction. And there was nothing that was really making it cohesive. And so I recognized that there was a lack of the design principles and the sort of like product principles that needed to exist that would then help to, for themselves, not just through me, make better decisions about where they should be investing their time when it comes to product development. And so I flew over to Boston, we worked on it for a day and a half, we developed what these were, and then we put them in place. And at that point forward, you know, the company has those to utilize to say, here's where we should make calls about the direction that our product should be headed, you know, by adding this feature, but not necessarily adding that one. So that's the example of the kind of thing that I try to do. And I think that by doing that type of work, that's probably the kind of thing that has differentiated me from others. And that's helped to lead to a lot of referrals where people are saying, you know, it's not just a matter of I've got somebody to go to to get my questions answered, but I've got somebody who's thinking about the questions that I should be asking myself, but I haven't really been asking. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like to get to where you are, you've experimented a lot. And, you know, with experimentation comes some bumps in the road and there are sometimes some things that don't work. So could you tell us a little bit about a time where you've stagnated or stopped making progress in one of your roles and then how you got things back on track? Yeah, I think as a business itself, it's stagnated for me when I thought that the right plan for for building more business for myself was to reach out directly to a bunch of CEOs of those companies that I wanted to work with or that I thought might be potentially a good match. And what was funny was I was able to get the meetings. You know, I would reach out to somebody who was a CEO or a founder of a startup and say, you know, hey, I'm a product expert. I can probably help you with a lot of things. I've got some ideas for your product and the direction that it can head. And I had done hours and hours of research on these companies ahead of time. I'd use their products. I had taken notes on what I thought were gaps in the user experience, et cetera. And then I would meet with them and I'd be ready to share all these notes. But the problem was every time that I met with them, I was, again, getting that cold shoulder where they were questioning what my motivations were. You know, what do you want from us? Are you looking for a job? We already have a VP of product. You know, I don't really, you know, necessarily think that I want to replace that person with you. And the issue was they weren't really sure why they were really taking the meeting for me or what my ulterior motives must have been. The reality is my interest is in just building more tech hubs through successes of individual startups on the East Coast. You know, I'm a Silicon Valley guy and I've seen how things have come together there to where all the puzzle pieces kind of fit together between venture capital and entrepreneurs and prior experience and ideas and universities, et cetera. And I've been trying to kind of help facilitate that same growth on the East Coast but people are really just, you know, honestly questioning a lot of times what my own motivations were to try to help them. And they couldn't get past, you know, it was like within five minutes, every single conversation led to, well, what do you charge per hour? And what is exactly that you want? And I don't really know if, if that's exactly what I need. And I'm just like, I don't want to get in a conversation about my resume. What I want to get in a conversation about is what you can do for your own company to help you be more successful. And if at the end that yields some sort of, you know, formal relationship that we have, fantastic. And if it doesn't, that's fine too, because I learn by doing and I have the time and I'm available to just kind of like help you with your business. And if we turn that into something fantastic, and if not, no big deal, I'm totally fine with that. And that was something that people had a really hard time, I think, appreciating when I was trying to reach out cold without some sort of a warm introduction from a VC or a board member or some other advisor that they're already working with. But as soon as those kinds of referrals started happening, where somebody said, you know, hey, I've worked with this guy at two of, of my other portfolio companies. I've heard some great you know, results of what's been going on here. I think you should go get lunch with them. It was a completely different dynamic. I mean, instead of leaning back in their chair when I was meeting them in the cafe, 
maybe leaning forward in their chair saying, you know, here are the three issues that I'm you know, facing right now. And I'd love to get your help with this because it was coming from somebody whom they trusted and somebody whom they knew had an aligned incentive trying to help to make their companies as successful as possible. And fitting into that was something that was really helpful. So for me, the, the recognition that I had was that what I needed to do to stop the stagnation of my business was not to try to reach out cold to my direct clients that I was trying to work with, but to reach out indirectly to the investors that they were working with, to the VC funds, and to get those kinds of relationships where those people would say, hey, wow, this is somebody who's out there who understands product really well. We're trying to invest in product-driven companies. Maybe I can point this person to some of the other portfolio companies that I'm working with, and that will help make me good on the promises that I made to them at the time that I invested in them, which is that our money is better than somebody else's money because not only are we providing capital to your company, but we're also providing a lot of resources and expertise that somebody else can't necessarily provide. And if look, if I'm the person who can happen to make good on that promise that they make to some of the companies that they work with, I'm more than happy to be that. And so by courting the relationships indirectly through the VCs in order to get business with the direct companies that they're invested in, that ended up being 10 times more valuable than all the meetings that I had and the copies that I had, et cetera. You know, I was like jittery from the caffeine by the end of the day, <laughs> meeting with, you know, companies that, that at the end of the day didn't really result in any new contracts for me. Yeah, that's interesting. I think sometimes as an advisor or a consultant, it can be really hard for the prospect on the other end to really understand why they're talking to you and your value prop. It can be really clear to you, but like I can't even tell you the number of job offers that I get from people that I'm, I'm talking to. And I'm always confused, like, why are you offering me a job? I already have a job. <laughs> I'm coming here to try to you know advise you or, or offer you like a part-time consulting engagement. And so those warm introductions really do make a big difference when somebody else can set the stage for you and explain to the prospect what your role is and how you can help them. So that foundation is already laid before you go in there. And then you can just have a meaningful conversation like you were describing. And that's exactly right. So it sounds like you have a lot going on. You're advising a number of startups. You're in high demand. So how do you take time to care for yourself and just enjoy life? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny when I contrast the work that I'm doing now to the work that I used to do in an operational role as a VP in a software company, I was probably working about 70 to 80 hours a week for 15 years of my life. And it was funny because I, you know, just to put it in perspective, my dad was a teacher for 35 years before he retired. And after 15 years of having done this, I decided to kind of stop and try to go my own path. And my dad was really confused saying, why would you do this? It seems like you're trying to quote unquote retire, you know, during this period. And, you know, I worked for 35 years. <laughs> it seems like it's a little bit earlier. And I, and I did the math and I realized that I actually worked more hours than my dad had worked when he retired. <laughs> and so, you know, while it had been fewer years, it was, it was more hours. And it's just sort of the, the reality of the startup life that is extremely demanding for you. So for me, to be honest, I probably compare my work now not to a 35 hour work week or a 45 hour work week, but I compare it more to the 80 hour work week that I used to have. And so I'm working fewer hours now than I used to. I'm not commuting because I'm spending most of my time working for my home office. And, you know, I get as a result, a lot more free time to spend with my wife, with my kids. And to me, it's so rewarding to have that. I've got more time to exercise, you know, take care of myself, which is something that's also very important to me. And it just has helped to have a much more sort of healthy relationship. Now, that said, I am really high in demand, and it's often the case that I need to turn away a lot of companies that I've spent a couple hours with courting to basically say, hey, look, I really like what you guys are doing, and I think it would be a good fit, but the reality is I probably have too much work in front of me right now, so either you know, let's try to reconnect maybe in six months, or you know, here are some resources and recommendations that I have for you to kind of get you on the right path yourself. But I think that we're probably not going to be in a position to be able to work together. So I've had to kind of shoo away business sometimes, which has been a little bit of a frustration for me because I do care very much about the type of work that I do. And I really do want to have the kind of influence as I talked about with companies that I'm working with. But at the same time, I want to make sure that I'm doing as good of a job as I can with the clients that I currently have. And I never want to make a sacrifice where a company that I've signed with that has expectations of me is not going to get the full, you know, the full impact of what I can potentially do because I say, oh, yeah, so, you know, I'd love to meet with you right now. And I agree that it's really important that we try to get together, but I'm booked for the next two weeks. You know, to me, it's kind of like 
the doctor's office where, you know, you feel like, hey, well, I really need to see you right now. And they say, you know, the next available appointment that I have is, is within three weeks. You know, maybe you should go find another doctor. Even if they're really good at what they do, they have to have availability for you. And I think the same thing is true for the business that I do as well. So I try to make sure that I, res- that I restrict the number of clients that I'm working with. I'm very crystal clear to have all these kinds of processes and spreadsheets and calculations and things like that for myself about how many hours I'm expecting that I'll be spending across my clients. And I, I expect there's going to be a spike, whether that spike ends up being the case or not with a few individual clients, you know, based on work that I know that they're doing, like maybe they're trying to come up with a new product strategy or it's the end of the year and they're trying to create their product development budgets for the following year. Those are things that I typically get involved in. So I kind of expect that there's going to be a rise in the number of hours. And I actively take steps to make sure that I've constrained the number of hours that I'm dedicated towards that work to A, ensure that I do a good job with everything that I do. And then B, that it doesn't come at a personal sacrifice that I would in retrospect wish that I hadn't been willing to make. Yeah. So it sounds like you're really good at setting boundaries, knowing how long you need to spend to get certain tasks done and knowing your limits and really sticking to them. And I think when you don't do that, that's when people start to run into problems of over committing themselves and stretching themselves too thin, which is What happens to a lot of entrepreneurs that serve in this advisory role and they can't leverage their time and outsource a lot of their activities and their work. So it's it's critical to do that the way that you're describing. So it makes a whole lot of sense. Well, let's go ahead and close out with a parting piece of guidance for us. You've given us so many great tips. I want to get one more before we go. (laughs) All right. Let's see. What would be a good parting tip? Well, here's one, I think. If I look back at my own career trajectory, I spent probably close to 20 years, probably about 18 years or so working in product management and, you know, all the way back from the, from the time that the role didn't even have a definition and nobody even knew what a product manager did all the way until now where people can major in the subject and, you know, people can have a focus on the MBA in that subject as well. So it's, it's been a pretty long period of time that I've worked in these operational roles and all along the way, I had to work these extremely long and challenging hours. I was flying all over the place. I took a day trip from DC to London. I mean, you know, just crazy kinds of commitments to the companies that I was working with. And every time that I did that, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't falling to the trap of the rat race where you continue to spend so much time working with a company and trying to, you know, make a name for yourself or try to get certain kinds of results or try to get a a promotion only to find that, as soon as I got there, that wasn't enough either. And I needed to go do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the discussion that I had with my wife that I think I come back to, honestly, I come back to it on a daily basis was that for every hour that I was going to spend extra doing that kind of work that I didn't necessarily have to do, it wasn't so we could get a bigger house or so that we could go, you know, so that I could feel good about my job title and things like that. It was so that for every hour that I spent, I could get two or three more hours later in my life with her and with my children. And that was something that I think in the end paid off. I was able to get that kind of thing because I worked really hard and really difficult hours for a long period of my life. I was willing to get that. But the motivational tip is not that you work hard and you necessarily get that. Some people do and some people don't. I think the motivational tip here is that by doing that kind of thing, if you're willing to commit to your former self that you'll actually follow through on that promise that you made, then it can be very rewarding. And for me, it really was. You know, there was a point several times, much like you said, I've been offered job opportunities all the time. You know, it probably isn't a month that goes by that I don't get, you know, one or two different job opportunities presented to me to go do something that would be really interesting. But I continue to say no because I have this level of commitment to my former self where I had made myself and my own family that promise that if I were to be successful enough that I could take more time with them, then I would actually choose to do so. And this manifests in many different ways. I mean, one of the things that I could do right now to to deal with the fact that I've got more business interested in working with me than I have opportunity to work with them is I could certainly go hire more consultants to go do some of the work myself. But in doing so, I would become the sales guy for my own consultancy. And it's not because I wanted to grow a consultancy that I was doing this. The reason I wanted to do this was to have a good lifestyle business that would allow me to have influence and to enjoy the work that I'm doing myself personally with the companies that I'm working with and to have a great reputation doing so. Not so much to just sort of like build it for the sake of building it, 
And, you know, I could totally imagine a future where I just end up being the salesperson and I've got a bunch of consultants scrambling around doing the work for me. But while that may financially make sense, the thing that I have to continue to commit to, and I think the thing that anybody can commit to themselves is to follow through on their promises to their former selves about why they were doing it in the first place. And I think if you ever forget that, you're going to be in trouble. But if you always remember that kind of thing, then you can have some great outcomes for your own life. Yeah, that's a great tip. I mean, if you find yourself kind of on that hamster wheel, putting in those long hours, really think about why you're doing it and what's motivating you to do that and what you're ultimately working towards. And don't just do that to get the next title unless that's what's important to you. But like you, I kind of did the same thing. I put a lot of hours in early in my career. I worked at Deloitte for a long time and that was kind of the name of the game there. And you know, it's allowed me now because I put that time in, I built my expertise and my competencies and all of the experience that I had that now I can kind of be more selective in who I work with and really work on the types of projects and with the clients that I love and have that lifestyle business like you're talking about. So it sounds very similar to my thinking as well. I hope today's episode inspires you to think more about how you can find your passion and live your best life. For more information, including links to resources that Ben and I chatted about today and how best to get in touch with him, head on over to our website, theboostpodcast.com, and check out our show notes from this episode and catch the Boost bonus. Ben, I want to thank you for sharing your journey with us today. And remember, anything is possible for you. Now that you've completed this episode, the next step is to join the Boost Squad for strategic insights, tips, and tricks, as well as exclusive resources designed specifically to accelerate your personal and professional growth. All this and more is waiting for you at theboostpodcast.com.